good afternoon, everybody. Paula Keane is my name, and I'm one of the liaison nurses here in the Rehabilitation Hospital. Um, I work with uh, Siobhan, whom some of you might know as well. Um, so uh, we share some of the load, but our roles are slightly different. Um, so today I'm going to go through a presentation on um, autonomic dysreflexia. Um, I'm going to take it quite slowly um, and I'll talk around the presentation. And um, I noticed a few mistakes in it this morning when I went to read through it, so please ignore those. But um, I'm going to try and share my screen now and hope that technology works. Um, please feel free to put in a, a question um, and we can work through them at the end if that's, if that's um, okay with you. Okay, so we'll go for the technology and see if this works. <clears throat> okay, how are we looking now? So, autonomic dysreflexia. No, that's not working. Hold on there. I'm just going to stop that share for a second and go back into it. Bear with me for a minute now. No, that's looking better. Okay, so first of all, we'll start with what is autonomic dysreflexia. So dysreflexia is a condition that's exclusive only to somebody who has sustained a spinal cord injury. Um, you won't see it in any other condition and anyone who tells you um, is, is, is not understanding their condition. Um, it's a condition uh, that we, t we deem a medical emergency. It occurs in individuals with a spinal cord injury at the level of the sixth thoracic vertebrae. That's where I noticed my mistake, so you'll see it there. I left out vertebrae. So level of the sixth thoracic vertebrae, um, if you can imagine that your ninth thoracic vertebrae is the very end of your sternum, so the sixth thoracic vertebrae, is just under halfway of your, of your breastbone. So if your injury is occurring around that area or above, you may be susceptible to autonomic dysreflexia. So it's characterized by a sudden increase in your blood pressure and a low heart rate. And in the medical world, we call that a bradycardia. Although uh, occasionally some patients can have a fast heart rate, which is known as tachycardia. Um, and just move us on to our next slide. Um, so as I said, it's unique to spinal cord injuries um, at or above the level of the sixth thoracic vertebrae. And it's caused by an overactivity of the autonomic nervous system. The main causes of autonomic dysreflexia, so in about 90% of cases, the main culprit that will cause it will be the bladder. So for example, a blocked catheter, kinked tubing, an overfull um, drainage bag. Uh, it can sometimes happen as a result of uh, urinary investigation. So if you were undergoing something like uh, urodynamics or perhaps a flexi-cystoscopy flexi to determine if you had stones or to, as a treatment for stones, there is a possibility that it could occur during that. Um, occasionally urinary tract infection can lead to it. Kidney stones, bladder stones are a big culprit also. Um, and bladder washouts. Some people who have uh, long-term catheters in would have regular bladder washouts and it has been reported that there has been episodes of dysreflexia after bladder installations. So the next common cause then would be the bowel. It is a lot less common than the bladder. It the bowel will tend not to creep up that quickly on you because you'll have an idea of how your bowel is going, whether or not you've been having good results from your bowel care or not. But where it might creep up suddenly on you is sometimes if you're having stimulation, rectal stimulation, it could set off an episode of dysreflexia. Sometimes it's been reported to me that people have got dysreflexic when suppositories have been inserted. If they had severe hemorrhoids and or if they had a anal tear or an anal fissure 
Um, the main culprit, though, could be constipation and generally stimulation with the bowel. They're the main culprits that do cause dysreflexia. And the less common causes then could be acute abdominal conditions such as um, an acute appendicitis or maybe an obstruction in the bowel, something like that could set it off. Skeletal fractures could set it off. So perhaps if you had had an accident and maybe driven a power chair into something um, and injured um, one of your lower limbs, you may not feel that fracture occur, but it could present itself with dysreflexia. Um, skin related disorders are common enough, ingrown toenails, pressure sores and burns. Um, we're getting a lot of people just um, coming back to me saying they're getting burns from the heated seats in cars. So we're heading into the winter time. So just to be aware that if you do sit directly onto your, your car seat um, and you have heated seats, don't have them up high. Um, somebody rang me who was dysreflexic, who didn't actually know that she had sustained a burn that day. And it was only when she got undressed that evening that she discovered the burn. So it can be a cause of it. Um, sexual activity, so particularly in uh, during ejaculation for any of the males, can set off dysreflexia. Um, and then labour and delivery for, for females. So they're the most common causes. It's not um, an inclusive list. Um, I'm sure that there's something that I haven't covered there that could cause it. Um, as I said, in 90% of cases, the most common cause will be the bladder. So how do I know I have it is the question I get asked a lot and a lot of carers and public health nurses will ask me, how, do, how will I know if the person I'm caring for is dysreflexic? So one of the first symptoms that occurs is a severe throbbing headache, a frontal headache comes uh, at the front of the head. Um, you might get flushing or blotching of the skin above the level of your injury. Um, you might have profuse sweating also above the level of your lesion. Um, and you might even, if you check your skin when you have it, you might almost have a straight line across your chest, be red and blotchy above it and you know sweat and have goosebumps above the level of your injury. Pardon me, and darker skin that can be a bit more difficult to see. So, in darker skin, people should look out for goosebumps, um, look out for the sweating because the flushing and the blotching is not as evident. Um, blurred vision, um, nasal congestion, shortness of breath, apprehension or anxiety. And I've even had people say to me on the wards that they um, have a feeling that they're going to die, they get this awful apprehension and a feeling of impending death has been um, described to me, but I haven't seen that in, in much literature. Um, high blood pressure, we've mentioned at the onset that it's characterised by a sudden increase in blood pressure and a slow heart rate, um, but we can't outrule um, a fast heart rate because some people do um, have a heart rate and not a slow heart rate. Um, and just to say there that um, in a cervical or a high thoracic injury, normal blood pressure is actually quite low for a lot of people. So um, when we say the blood pressure is raised, um, it could be only raised about 15 to 30 milligrams of mercury higher than the baseline um, blood pressure. So it's a good idea to know what your baseline blood pressure is you know, perhaps pop on a, a portable blood pressure monitor and get an idea of what your, your baseline blood pressure is. I've had people ring me to say they had to go to A&E to perhaps have a catheter changed. And when they were in triage with the nurse, their blood pressure was checked and the blood pressure might have been 120 over 90. And that didn't set off any alarm bells for the nurse doing it, but it was a high blood pressure for that person. So it's really important that you would have an idea of your baseline blood pressure. Um, so on examination then we'd be looking at a blood pressure of 20 to 40 milligrams of mercury above the baseline and or a systolic blood pressure greater than 150. So the systolic is the higher number when you record a blood pressure um, and as I said to you it's a good idea to know your baseline uh, blood pressure. I would recommend that everyone who has an injury above T6 um, or even anyone who has a cord injury have a portable blood pressure monitor. Uh, it's always good for us to keep an eye on our blood pressure and, and make sure it's behaving itself. And they're quite inexpensive now, available in most pharmacies and Argos, those kind of stores do them as well. So I'd recommend that people have that. And certainly any of our 
high cervical injuries and high thoracic injuries when they're leaving the NRH, we recommend that they do have a, a portable BP monitor at home. So I said to you early in the presentation that it is a medical emergency. If not treated, so if we do nothing um, and you have dysreflexia, it could lead to a stroke, it could lead to a cerebral hemorrhage, it could lead to seizures, it could lead to a myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack or even death. But I know that slide's a bit frightening, but just to look back and read it, it is a medical emergency and if it's not treated, so what we're going to do from here on in is talk about the treatment that we would use for it. So although it's, it, it's a scary slide to see stroke, cerebral hemorrhage and even death, once it's treated, all of those things would be avoided. So what to do if it happens? So the first thing we're going to do is assist the person to sit up if possible. So we're sitting them up and lowering their legs if it's at all possible. So we're doing the direct opposite to what you would do if somebody feels faint. If somebody feels faint, we'd lie them down and we'd raise their legs in an effort to rise their blood pressure. And we're doing the direct opposite. We're sitting them up and lowering their legs. You're going to call for help. So if there's a, another family member in the house, you're going to ask them to come and give you a hand. Loosen any tight clothing. If you're a high cervical injury and you're wearing an abdominal binder, open that. Um, any tight leg straps that might be there from a catheter drainage bag, loosen those. If you're wearing TED stockings, take them down. Um, and any tight shoes, take them off. Because all of those things will allow the muscles to relax and will actually lower blood pressure. Pop on your portable BP monitor um, and check what the blood pressure actually is. And then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look for the cause. And I did say to you earlier on that the main cause would be the catheter. So the catheter will be our first port of call to check to make sure that the catheter is not um, blocked. <coughs> so we're checking our catheter first. So we're going to check to see if the catheter is blocked, if the tubing is kinked in any way, if perhaps you're sitting on the tubing, um, if maybe when you got dressed some of the clothing came up against the, the catheter bag and caused a, um, a, a kink in the tubing. Check for a full leg bag or a full drainage bag, so if the bag is over full it leads to backflow into the bladder um, and could cause the bladder to fill without any means to empty it. Um, if you were doing self-intermittent catheterizations and you felt it was as a result of the bladder, you could go ahead and do um, just a once-off catheterization to empty the bladder. Uh, sometimes people who have suprapubic catheters, uh, we would show them how to perhaps use an in and out catheter to take the emergency out of the situation that will drain the bladder. Um, and then we could look at getting the suprapubic catheter checked, but that would require some training here in the NRH or in the urology department. So the bowel would be less common. I did mention that the catheter is the main one. And with the bowel, if you haven't been having good results, that might lead you to um, keep in the back of your mind that you, you may become dysreflexic from no bowel result. Not everybody does, um, but it's just something that, that to keep, to keep in the back of your mind and to be aware of. So if we were sure that it was as a result of the bowel, we would do a rectal check. If there was stool in there, we would remove it gently. So we'd be wearing uh, protective gloves and have lots of lubrication. Um, if we were thinking that the dysreflexia was due to digital stimulation during bowel care, it's a good idea to use a gel that might have some local anaesthetic in it, like in still a gel or a lignocaine gel. And what that will do is it'll dampen down the nerves in the anus, which will allow your carer or yourself, if you're doing your own bowel care, to go ahead and do your um, stimulation and complete your bowel care. Um, and it should help the blood pressure to stay stable. Um, without it, the blood pressure um, is in danger of rising even further. So I know this is a really busy slide. Um, this is the slide that we give out to our public health nurses or to other hospitals if some of our patients are going on to it. 
The piece that I just want to draw your attention to is the lower left side where it says emergency treatment for autonomic dysreflexia. Um, the rest of the slide you can have glanced through at your own leisure when, when you have some time. Um, and I think some of these sessions are going to be recorded so you'll be able to go back over them and have a look at them. So I'm just drawing your attention really to the lower left hand side. So the emergency treatment for autonomic dysreflexia. So we've spoken about the signs and the symptoms. So we want to, just going to recap over those. So a rise in the blood pressure. So it's a blood pressure that might be 20 to 30 milligrams of mercury above your normal blood pressure. Sweating, a pounding headache, flushed skin. So you'd be flushed above the level of your injury. You might get um, nasal congestion. You might get a tight chest and you might get some blurring of vision. So what we're going to do, I've already gone through this, but just to recap, we're going to call for assistance, help the person to sit upright and lower the legs, loosen any tight clothing, abdominal binders, legs, straps, head stockings, etc. Monitor the blood pressure until symptoms have resolved. And then we're going to go, first of all, to the bladder because we know that the bladder is, is one of the main reasons that dysreflexia may occur. So, um, Check the bladder, check that there's urine in the bag, check that it's not over full, that it's not kinked. Um, and then the next, sec the next cause would be constipation. We'll be popping a blood pressure monitor on, keeping an eye on the blood pressure. Um, and if the symptoms persisted and we were unable to reverse the cause, so perhaps you've gone, you've looked at the catheter, um, you have no idea whether it's the bowel that might be causing it, we um, need to do something because we don't want the blood pressure to continue to rise because if the blood pressure continues to rise it may lead to those serious side effects that we referred to earlier in the presentation um, and the main treatment that's used is nifedipine 10 milligrams so it's a bite and swallow capsule it's a capsule that you'd have to bite into to release the liquid um, and then swallow it down and the reason you bite into it and swallow it is that or the medication will be absorbed very quickly into the oral mucosa and then the remainder of it will be absorbed somewhat in, in the stomach. Um, if you swallow it, it'll take much longer to work. So we're advising people to have nifedipine 10 milligrams readily available if you have a lesion or an injury above T6. Um, and keep an eye on it because people get the, the tablet prescribed and they have it there and they don't have any reason to use it and it may go out of date so it's a good idea just to you know keep an eye, an eye on your expiration date of your nifedipine. Um, in the end of 2018 nifedipine actually became quite difficult to get. It um, became an unlicensed drug I believe and a lot of pharmacies and a lot of patients had difficulty sourcing the nifedipine. Um, so to that end um, the treatment that was recommended then was the GTN spray, the uh, glycerine trinitrate spray. So um, when you push the spray it gives you 400 micrograms of a dose of GTN. So the recommended dose is one spray under the tongue and repeat it twice, repeat it to a maximum of twice. So that would give you three times in total with doses of approximately two minutes apart. Um, now, the nifedipine is now back readily available, but oddly in the last fortnight, I've had about four phone calls from different patients and one from a GP who reported that the nifedipine bite and swallow capsule has become difficult to source again. So if you're having difficulty sourcing the nifedipine, uh, perhaps ask your GP to prescribe the GTN spray. And if there's any queries in relation to the dose of that, um, I can send that information out to you or to your GP, whatever's easiest for you. Um, so as I, just to recap there, um, if the symptoms do persist and you don't know the cause, we're going to administer the nifedipine 10 milligram bite and swallow. If the, that will lower the bleed, blood pressure um, pretty quickly um, and I know that some patients report that they don't like taking the nifedipine 10 milligrams 
because they can get quite a severe rebound hypotension, which may not allow them to get up that day or perhaps even the next day because their blood pressure is in their boots. Um, but we do, if we don't know what the cause is, the blood pressure will continue to rise if we don't treat it. So it is recommended that you would take the nifedipine 10 milligrams if you can't reverse the cause straight away. If the blood pressure is not settling and we can't identify the cause, so we've looked at the bladder, the bladder looks okay, it's draining, there's urine in the bag, uh, tubing's not kinked, catheter doesn't look or appear that it's blocked, um, and the bowel hasn't been problematic, they're having good results. Um, you should contact your um, medical team. And if you're at home in the house and you're alone, you could you can contact the emergency services by dialing 999. Um, they do say that if you're in doubt, call them out. They won't bring you to hospital, particularly in COVID times now, unless they absolutely had to, but at least they'll check you over. Um, they'll be able to check your blood pressure and do some further investigations that you wouldn't be able to do alone in your house. So if, if in doubt, call the, the paramedics out. Um, but once you've taken your nifedipine 10 milligrams, you actually will take the emergency out of the situation and you'll buy yourself a bit of time to help determine what the cause of the AD actually is. So to prevent it, um, regularly do your, your bladder. So if you're on intermittent catheterizations, don't leave too uh, long between the catheterizations. Um, and if you have a suprapubic or an indwelling urethral catheter in situ and you're on regular bladder washouts, continue to do those to keep your, your bladder patent, your catheter patent, sorry. Um, continue with your, your regular bowel program, whether it's daily or alternate daily or alternate days. Um, keep your skin healthy, mind your pressure areas, um, foot care, the nails on, on your feet, um, just make sure there's no signs of any ingrown toenails or that might become infected and lead on to subsequently cause dysreflexia. Avoid extreme hot and cold. Um, take your prescribed medications. If you're concerned, consult your GP or consult us here in the NRH. Um, and just to conclude there, autonomic dysreflexia is recognised as a medical emergency. Uh, but unfortunately, some healthcare professionals will go through their entire medical career, doctors and nurses, etc. And they'll never come across a patient with dysreflexia. So uh, don't get too illusioned if you go to an accident and emergency department uh, with perhaps a blocked suprapubic catheter because that's the only means you have to have it changed at that time. And the staff there have never heard of dysreflexia. Um, you can just refer them to, um, they can check it out, they can look it up, they can talk to colleagues. Um, and I think some information will be available on the SAI website. Um, or they're welcome to contact any of the medical staff in the NRH or indeed myself. Um, Promoting knowledge regarding autonomic dysreflexia among spinal injury patients is huge. Um, and, and today we'll, we'll go a long way to doing that. And if these are, are recorded and left on the SAI website, it'll help to, to spread information. Um, if people have come through the NRH system, they will have been educated in dysreflexia if their injury is above T, T, at T6 or above. So it won't be something that's new to them. Um, it's always something that people are frightened of though um, and people like to be updated if there's any new treatments or um, any change in the treatment. The main thing and I suppose the take home message really is early recognition so that you recognise the signs of it and that you come in quickly with your treatment. And once you do that you'll minimise the complications and that awful frightening slide that was there earlier on in the presentation um, about the complications that might occur, we'll avoid them as long as we have prompt treatment. So, so if you're in doubt, you can't call, find the cause, um, just go ahead and take your nifedipine. So, um, and lastly then, I'll just leave you with to be aware of dysreflexia, be prepared, have your nifedipine. If your nifedipine is coming up to its expiration date, um, have it replaced. And uh, It's also a good idea to have it perhaps in a place that's easily accessible for you or for your carers um, so that they know where it is as well. Um, 
and that's it. Um, that's my contact details there, my number and my email. If you, um, if we don't get to the questions after this, um, I have no problem if you want to email me with any questions or indeed call me, my contact number is there. Um, it's difficult, I know, to perhaps think of questions on the spot and you might go away and think of something. There's absolutely no problem. Just go ahead, drop me an email or give me a call um, and I'll endeavour to get back to you with, with, with an answer. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I think Philip is just Paula. coming back in. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. Um, and a hugely important topic, as you mentioned. Um, I can see we have a few questions have come through. Okay. Um, so is Adelaide Nefedabin is our first yes. one? Yes, it is. And should you only take 10 milligrams or can you take too much? So 10 milligrams will be enough to drop the blood pressure, enough for you to buy you time to check uh, what the cause of it is. Um, because people with high cervical injuries work off a, a low blood pressure at the best of times, um, and of course that's not everybody, some people will have actually um, hypertension. Um, I wouldn't be taking more than 10 milligrams of nifedipine because you could, you know, drop your blood pressure too low, um, which could cause you to actually lose consciousness. So 10 milligrams is the dose that's recommended. Um, we wouldn't recommend more than that. If we're not getting control of our blood pressure after 10 milligrams of mercury, we need some medical assistance. Okay, that's great. Or 10, mercury, I said 10 milligrams of nifedipine. Nifedipine. Right. <laughs> um, I see another question in here. Is it possible for a family or friend to get training in this area? So if um, a family or a friend wants to contact me, I don't have a problem. I can, I can give them uh, what information I have through it. Um, I don't think there's an official um, training program for it, um, but I have no problem if somebody wants to, to contact me, I can run them through it. Um, there is information um, on the NRH website. Now, I'm not actually sure if there's anything there for dysreflexia. I can check that out. But please don't, if, you know, if there's something you need to know or a question, please just, just give, me a, give me a contact, whether it's email, text, whatever's easiest for you. Brilliant. That's great. Thank you, Paula. And I can see another question coming through here. Um, so email from a 46 year old. This lady sustained a C5, C6 incomplete spinal cord injury 20 years ago. Okay. She's been having mild dysreflexia, uh, dysreflexia symptoms. My temperature spikes and I feel very weak and need to take paracetamol and then have a craving for sugar. I have had blood tests and all have come back normal. It will generally pass after 30 minutes, but I'm a bit worried as it happens randomly. And I now always need to have paracetamol with me at all times. Okay, so, so is she doing the right thing, I think, is her question, or is there anything she can do to prevent the AD from happening? Okay, so I suppose it's difficult to know just with that limited bit of information whether or not they're true dysreflexic episodes. Um, it's certainly she, she's having some of the symptoms of it. Um, it could be a case that she's feeling weak and dropping her blood sugar and needing to recoup that. She did say she craves a bit of sugar afterwards. Um, it just might be beneficial for her to pop a BP cuff on her just to check her blood pressure, see if that is rising and she'll definitively know whether she's dysreflexic then or not. Um, and indeed, it, it could be that her blood pressure is just a bit labile. It's, it's high one, one time and then low the next time. So I, I think check her blood pressure, uh, get an idea of what, what's happening to her blood pressure when she's having these episodes. Um, and then she'll have a better idea whether she's dysreflexic or not. She, um, she's incomplete. When, when your injury is incomplete, it somewhat lessens the, the risk of getting dysreflexia, but it doesn't eradicate it at all. So indeed, they could be true dysreflexic episodes. Um, if the blood pressure is continuing to rise, she might need to have treatment for that. Um, if she's being relieved by paracetamol, kind of makes me think that it's not perhaps dysreflexia. Um, but she's welcome to, to, to give me a call and I can talk, that through, I can talk um, her through it. It's just difficult to answer that definitively, having not that, uh, more background information. Okay, brilliant. Um, I have another question for you. So they're coming in hard and fast, Paula. Keep okay. you on your toes. Um, I've had to endure AD events for over 10 years now and have never met anyone else in the same boat. It would be great to hear how others manage it. Do any of the SII peer support volunteers 
have experience of AD and is there anyone in the Limerick Clare area I could link in with? So I suppose that's nearly more of ourselves. So Hilary Keppel is our peer support coordinator. So what we will do is push Hilary's contact details in there. Um, and you can um, follow up with Hilary, we can see about linking you in. Obviously at the moment, um, all our support is done over the phone. Um, okay. We'll have face to face at the moment. But Philippe, so, uh, if that person has, has concerns about it, um, you know, um, like people shouldn't be just at home worrying of like, am I going to get dyslexic? You know, pose the questions to your GP, pose them to me. Um, if you're coming up for an appointment here, you know, even to, to one of their spinal consultants, uh, we can ask them that. But like, don't be at home worried about, you know, a condition that may or may not happen. I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to take any of those queries. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and just from the same gentleman we had a question in earlier about the nifedipine, is it stupid to tough it out and can the AD just stop without taking it? Um, it won't stop until the cause is is been released. So it's a noxious stimuli, a painful stimuli that causes the blood pressure to rise. Um, so unless that stimulus is removed, the blood pressure will continue to rise. So um, some people get dysreflexic, know that it's directly related to their catheter, they do a bladder washout or, or even just pass an intermittent catheter if, if that's what they're doing for bladder management. Um, and they don't need to take the nifedipine because once the cause has been removed, the blood pressure will settle and it settles really, really quickly. So to answer the question on whether you should tough it out, if you're happy to tough it out, the cause would need to be removed fairly quickly, otherwise the blood pressure will continue to rise. So I wouldn't recommend people to tough it out if they have no ability to remove the cause. Okay, that's perfect. Um, we have another one in here from Robert. So hi Paula, I am a C5, C6 for 30 years. I have noticed that I get sweats and headaches. Is it natural to get it more as you get older? Um, it's, it's, it's a tough question because um, it's hard to know whether the sweating and the headaches are directly related to dysreflexia or are they related to perhaps a, a urinary tract infection. Um, so so it's, it's a difficult one to answer without having some more information. Um, for some reason, and we don't really understand why, people who have been injured for long periods of time can actually become dysreflexic. Um, and they, there's no real reason why they're dysreflexic. They just become sensitized to it. And then it can go away quite quickly. And they never really find out whether it was the catheter, the bowel, skin. They don't really know what it was. Um, so I, it, that's a trickier one to answer. And I'd tell Robert to give me a ring about that if he's concerned. Perfect. That's great. And I know David is um, sharing your contact details and as we mentioned earlier, we have the handouts as well and okay. recording, so we can pass them on to our service users and we'll be putting them up. So That's great. And touch. you know, it, 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 it is a scary phenomenon and you know, even when I do bowel training um, with the public health nurses, it always seems to, to scare them. But I think, you know, information is always power and if people are informed and know how to to treat it, um, I think then the fear factor actually reduces considerably. Absolutely.